Good evening. I'm Max Angerholzer, CEO of the George and Barbara Bush Foundation, and thank you for joining us for a very special virtual event with my dear friend Jean Becker. She has a great new book that we're going to hear about shortly, The Man I Knew, about George H.W. Bush's post-presidency. Before we get into the meat of the conversation, I do have a few thank yous. I want to thank our staff at the Foundation and also the staff from the former office of President Bush who are here helping tonight to make this special, to make it work for us. Also want to thank our friends from Texas A&M University. One of the greatest things about the George and Barbara Bush Foundation is our partnership and relationship with Texas A&M. And so we have the honor of working with Aggies day in and day out, um, especially our friends at the Bush School, led by General Mark Welsh, and of course our colleagues and partners at the Presidential Library, led by my fellow Alabamian, Warren Finch. Um, I also want to thank our corporate partners and our friends from Charter Communications for helping to make tonight possible and all they do um, in their work and what they do to support us at the foundation, especially Catherine Bohegan and Avery Boggs. So I have about a 20 minute soliloquy on Jean's bio, <laughs> which I was planning to go into, but I'm gonna keep it a little shorter because Jean's tough and I don't wanna upset her. But all of you know Jean, most of you probably know her very, very well, but as you know, she's a proud native of Missouri. Um, she is a journalism graduate of the University of Missouri. And Go Tigers. Go Tigers. Apparently she will paint her face for Tiger football and basketball games. So that's something we need to look forward to. Um, after graduating, <laughs> she moved to Washington. Um, she got into journalism right away, was a rising star, um, worked at USA Today, um, and uh, most particularly and especially for our conversation tonight um, in 1987 and 1988 um, during President Bush's presidential campaign. Um, after that, she worked for Mrs. Bush in the White House as her deputy press secretary. And then, for our conversation this evening, um, she joined the Bushes back in Houston in 1993 and was President Bush's chief of staff from 1994 until he passed away in 2018. So, Jean, I'd like to turn it over to you to get us started. That's very dangerous for you to do that because, as I was telling Max, Max should be very nervous right now, very afraid. I have been home alone all week promoting this book. It's been so fun. This is my first book event, and I'm so grateful to the George and Barbara Bush Foundation for hosting this. But I've been home doing interviews morning, noon, and night on Skype, on Zoom. I'm finally out in public. I'm finally with other people, and I'm just sort of giddy. I feel a little unplugged, Max. Do you feel nervous? I'm nervous for myself and you, all our viewers. You maybe should be, because here's where we're going to start. Thanks to you, this was a brilliant idea. We're sitting in President Bush's office, which is now the George and Barbara Bush Foundation took, off, took over the office of George Bush at 10,000 Memorial. So here we are in the office as we're sitting in front of his desk. And this is sort of the room where it happened, which some of you might recognize as a song from Hamilton. I'm just going to throw it out there that you might want to perform that song before the night is over. If we run out of things to talk about. Absolutely. I'm just willing to thought. do that. Willing to do it. Love okay. that musical. Drink a little more of the uh, <clears throat> coffee in our flag coffee mugs. That yes, might help. So before we talk about the book, this is very dangerous. I was going to do some, I looked at everyone attending, I was going to do some shout outs, and then I realized I would have to shout out to hundreds of people because you're all shoutable. It is so exciting, everyone who has tuned in, thank you so much, you're all so special. You all played such a big part in the Bush's life. I'm gonna just name one person in one group. The amazing Mark Ward, a public servant, the best example of a public servant, he worked for USAID, I think for 30 years, he was the advisor to President Bush on all his disaster work. President Bush called him Mr. Disaster. Mark woke up early and is watching from Afghanistan. So thanks to him, we're international. We've gone international, which is very exciting. Love it. I also do want to shout out to all my relatives in Missouri. I am one of a gazillion Beckers. How many cousins and do you have, Jean? I think I have 55 first cousins, big families, both my mom's side, my dad's side, my sisters, my niece, thank you for watching. You have quadrupled our audience tonight, so thank you. Now let's talk about the book. Thank you, Jean. <laughs> you know, I think one of the things that I love about um, our work at the George and Barbara Bush Foundation is 
we have the opportunity and the responsibility to talk about the values and ideals that made George and Barbara Bush who they were and who they are today with us still. Um, and we can build upon their legacy of service mm -hmm. and what they've done for others. And it's incredible to be with you here tonight because we can focus on what the Bushes did and what President Bush did after he left the White House. So the question that I'm gonna ask first, which is not really that much of a unique question, but one that I was thinking about when I read this for the second time. It's actually better the second time, so I encourage you to read it multiple times <laughs> and buy multiple copies of the book. But what led you to finally write this book and why? Well, I gave it a lot of thought and uh, I wasn't sure I should write the book because I don't believe in tell-alls and I wanted to be very careful not to tell stories that were not mine to tell. And I do talk about in the author's note, I don't reveal confidences. I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk about things that I think President Bush told me in confidence or things that maybe I overheard him talking to other people about. But the man left behind so many great stories. He was so much fun. He lived a bigger than life life. It was a wild roller coaster ride for 25 years. It was wild. As I say in the book, Mikhail Gorbachev once told me to shut up. At least that's what his interpreter claimed. And I once was kissed by Tom Selleck. Wow, Magnum PI. That was big. Now Mr. Blue Blood. And down the road later in the evening, I think we'll talk a little bit about George Clooney. So it was exciting. So I decided it'd almost be criminal not to tell these stories. So I wrote the book. So would the book have been finished when it was if we hadn't have lived through a pandemic? Did that help you with your oh, writing? Oh, that helped a lot. That definitely helped a lot. Um, I wrote the book during the pandemic and I'm so grateful to George Bush that uh, I'm able to say, when people say, well, what did you do, do during the pandemic? And I can say, I wrote a book. And I love being able to say that. Unfortunately, I also found out, and I talked about this a little bit during Pearls of Wisdom, the book I wrote about her, you cannot write a book and diet at the same time. Here are the three things that don't go together. Writing a book, a pandemic, dieting. That didn't work. So I was gonna do this book tour as a very skinny size eight, but I'm doing it as Lizzo. Lizzo is my hero. And I can see people now at home Googling, who's Lizzo? The young people know. Look her up, you'll get it. But there's a second reason why I wrote the book. Do you want me to talk about that now? I'd love you to. So I want to do exactly what you want. <laughs> I don't believe you, but thank yeah, you. I, okay. Uh, so I wrote the book for fun. And I started writing it and I realized it was a lot of fun, but there was something much bigger emerging on these pages. President Bush really left all of us a blueprint on how to live our life. He lived life, he wasn't perfect, none of us are perfect, but oh my gosh, he knew how to live life with purpose, with a big heart, he had a servant's heart, he also lived life with joy, he never forgot the three most important things in life, faith, family, and friends, and all the points of light people out there are going to be so happy that I'm going to say this. He never forgot, he used to say this a lot, and it was part of why he founded Points of Light, that any definition of a successful life must include serving others. So he taught the rest of us how to live life. And I think when people read this book, they're gonna see, okay, this is who I wanna be. So I think the challenge of this evening is there are a million questions that I wanna <laughs> ask, and we will continue this when our, when our friends sign off later. But I think one that I think would be really interesting, and I know it's been talked about a lot over the years, but I've never heard you expound upon it. People like to talk about the relationships between presidents, mm -hmm. current president, past presidents. And we think back to 1992 um, and that very competitive and difficult race between um, President Clinton and President Bush. And many of us are very familiar with the famous letter that President Bush mm -hmm. wrote to Bill Clinton on January 20th, 1993, which I think is a good lesson for us in how we live our life every day about putting country before party, about putting others before yourself. 
But I think one of the things that all Americans have been fascinated and intrigued by, and frankly, it's brought us together during hyperpartisan times, is the relationship between President George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton. And you were there when this, when this started. Can you talk a little bit about this and what they did together and what that meant to President Bush? I would love to. I would love that question because it is probably the best example of how President Bush taught us to live life, how it's meant to be lived. He and President Clinton were political rivals. And as you mentioned, he left him an amazing letter on January 20th, 1993. We'll talk about this picture in a minute. Um, and they were civil to each other, but they weren't good friends. And what happened, the matchmaker was the 43rd President of the United States, George W. Bush. And on Christmas Day, 2004, a horrible tsunami hit South Asia. And it was one of the worst natural disasters in the history of the world that had ever been recorded. And the United States, of course, started sending lots of aid and they sent Navy ships and the president was doing everything he could through the government. But the private sector needed to get involved. All the great nonprofits like Doctors Without Borders, Catholic Charities, AmeriCares, they're all sending as many resources as they can, but they needed money. This was a huge disaster. So the 43rd president had the idea of asking his dad and President Clinton if they would help raise money for the private sector charity groups that were trying to help. And they readily said yes. They, of course, agreed. And they started doing a lot of interviews and PSAs, and they were very cordial to each other. Hello, Bill. Hello, George. But then in February, the president asked the two of them to travel to Asia to visit the tsunami countries to represent him, to represent the United States, and just to let that part of the world know, we're here for you, what can we do, what else can we do? And they left on that trip, I went with them, and they left as cordial colleagues, and they came home best friends. And I will tell you two stories. Um, I think just doing that journey together, I mean, we saw devastation unlike they had ever seen, certainly I had ever seen. It was just devastating. And President Bush still, he had not been diagnosed yet with Parkinson's disease, but he was slowing down. He was noticeably frail. And Tom Frechette, who was the aide who traveled with him and myself, we put a bug in President Clinton's ear that he needed to watch out for him. He needed to help maybe help him down the plane stairs, maybe help him out of his seat. He was getting a little frail. We didn't know what was going on with him. And President Clinton was wonderful. He gave him the only bed on the plane. I must say that Tommy and I did our part by staying up all night playing a card game with President Clinton. Good for you. Oh, hell. That's what I did for my country. Did you win? <clears throat> I did, and it shocked President Clinton, but I come from a family of card players. I knew how to play cards. But he gave President Bush the bed. He was very, very protective of him. President Bush, on the other hand, is the one who kept President Clinton on time. There were times he said, Bill, we need to go. There was another time he told him to quit talking because these two men standing alongside the road in Sri Lanka were trying to explain their water purification system. And President Clinton was talking to them about something he saw in Africa. And President Bush said, Bill, let them talk. So it was this wonderful relationship. Mrs. Bush is convinced that in President Bush, Bill Clinton found the father he never had. On this trip, that relationship sort of naturally revolved. You have the younger man watching out for the man who was about 25 years his senior, but you have President Bush saying, Bill, get in the car. It's time to go. And they came home best friends. And so a quick story, hopefully, Pope John Paul II dies, and the President of the United States, still George W., decides that it would be a show of great respect from the country if the former presidents, he and the First Lady, were going to head up the team, the, the, the U.S. delegation to the funeral, and he invited all the former presidents to go with him. And President Ford could not go. Um, he was too old and weak. President Carter had a conflict. But President Bush 41 immediately said, I would love to go. He knew John Paul II well and respected him. So President Clinton's chief of staff, a woman named Laura Graham, called me and said, he can't go. 
President Clinton can't go. We just had open heart surgery. His cardiologist said, absolutely not. But President Clinton just said to me, you know, Laura, I think I'm going to call George Bush. I'm going to get his opinion on whether I should go, which, of course, makes no sense. And Laura called me and said, he's got to shut this down. I said, don't worry. So I go tell President Bush in this office, he was sitting right, in, right there in that chair. I think the chair is gone, right behind this office, this desk. And I tell him, and then the phone rings. The receptionist says, sir, President Clinton's on line one. So President Bush picks up the phone, and here's the conversation I hear. Bill, I think you can go. I think it's perfectly safe for you to go. We're going on Air Force One. They have that great medical unit. George might even give you his bed to sleep in on the way over. I don't think that happened. I'm not positive. But everyone will take care of you, and I would sort of like for you to go. We can hang out, and we can visit people together. And so President Clinton's like, great, I'm going. So he hangs up, and I said, what just happened? And he says, well, I want him to go. He's fun. I want Bill to go. So then I get a call from Laura Graham, and she said, what the hell was that? I'm like, I'm sorry. That's their friendship. Do we have time to tell what happened at the Vatican? Yes, ma'am. I work for you. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> I'm glad you remembered that. Yes, You're very smart. I'm glad we hired you. Uh, so they get to Rome about midnight. And they get off Air Force One, and the motorcade goes immediately to St. Peter's, uh, where the Pope is lying in state, to pay their respects. And I'm watching on TV back in Houston in my office, which was right next door, and I just started crying. I grew up in a big Catholic family. My little brother is a Catholic priest. President Bush wanted him to be Pope, but that's another whole story. We won't have time for that one. Uh, but I just it was just so emotional to see the President of the United States, Laura Bush, President Bush 41, Bill Clinton, they all come in, Andy Card, they all come in, pay their respects. What I did not know is when they left St. Peter's, they go out into St. Peter's Square, and there's the White House motorcade. It's one o'clock in the morning, and the President of the United States, so this is so normal, this is what happens in a normal family, says, Dad, do you all need a ride? <laughs> the President is staying at the embassy residence, and his dad and Bill Clinton are staying at a hotel. And, I, and, and Tom Frechette told me this story, and Tommy said, you could tell that the president really did not want to leave his dad and a former president just standing there at one o'clock in the morning. And they're both like, no, 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 you go. We, we, have, we have our own, uh, you'll have to pick those up for yes, me eventually, but not now. Thank you. You, you. you go ahead. President Bush said, George, you go ahead. We're, we find, we have our own cars. Well, the motorcade races out of St. Peter's Square. There is not a car in sight. It's George Bush, Bill Clinton, their two aides, and Secret Service, and no cars. To make a long story short, they found the cars. Their motorcade was out on the street. But while the Secret Service was hustling to bring in their motorcade, another delegation pulls up, gets out of the car, and they're a little surprised to see George Bush and Bill Clinton standing in St. Peter's Square at one o'clock in the morning. And again, Tom Frechette told me all this because I wasn't there. They start taking pictures. The new delegation's like, well, can we have pictures with you all? And finally, someone sidled over to President Bush and said, sir, that's the Iranian delegation. We need to get in the cars and go. Great opportunity for unplanned <laughs> diplomacy, right? That's right, exactly. So I'd like to get back a little later to that period of time and what President Bush did um, addressing some of these natural disasters. Um, and I think many Americans, younger Americans, that's how they know him now mm -hmm. is what he did after the tsunami, Katrina, Rita, Hurricane Harvey. I think that's how a lot of Americans know him because right. they weren't alive when he was president. And that's extraordinary that he had this additional opportunity to connect with more people. But we're sitting in this office, right. and we're talking about Bill Clinton and his tendency to be a night owl. Mm -hmm. President Bush was a morning guy. Yes, he was. And he was coming to this office for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And so that meant that you, who I don't think you're always a morning person, you had to be here when President Bush arrived at 7. So how many times did you get the question, or the statement, more likely? The statement. Gene, I have an idea. It's an entire chapter in the book. 
and he would show up at seven o'clock in the morning. He would have had a pot of coffee. He would have read four newspapers. I'm nursing my first cup of coffee. It did have coffee in it then. And he would come in my office and sit down. He said, Gene, I have an idea. And it would scare me because it could be something really big. Sometimes it was, let's go get pizza for lunch at Fuzzy's, which is just down the street. You can almost see Fuzzy's from here. And other times it would be, Gene, I'm gonna start jumping out of perfectly good airplanes. I'd be like, really? Okay, you're gonna start parachuting. Well, how do we think we're gonna do that? That's sort of interesting. And then there's other times, and there were other big ideas. Let's go to Chichijima. Let's, you know, we're gonna talk about George Clooney in a minute, which is one of his bigger ideas. But sometimes, quite frankly, I couldn't figure out what he was thinking. I think we have a funny photo of him talking to me uh, wearing an aardvark hat. And I love this photo because it just gives you a flavor of what my life was like for 25 years. I once, Max, since you brought up Missouri, on the Tigers were in the March Madness and I wore my tiger ears to work the day of their game. That seems very reasonable. Little cute tiger ears. And I'm wearing them and President Bush says, I cannot talk to you with those tiger ears on. Well, I talked to him with that aardvark cat on. Fair point. But that's why it was such a roller coaster. You never knew he, he was the biggest idea man I ever met. So the great thing about this book is there's a million amazing stories in here. And I'm not going to ask you for your top 10 favorite stories from the book or from your life with President Bush, but can we have maybe one of your favorites? Yes, it has to be George Clooney. And because, for one thing, I want to reveal something for the first time tonight that I've not talked about in public. There are some friends and relatives who are watching that I think have heard this before. So let me tell the story first and then sort of tell the untold story. So right, what most Americans don't know is right after Katrina, like two weeks after Katrina, another big hurricane came ashore called Hurricane Rita. And it came ashore west of New Orleans. It devastated pretty much the remaining coastline of Louisiana and hit some of the Texas coastline very hard. And they just weren't getting any attention. I mean, obviously the federal government, FEMA, they all were doing their part. But as far as the media, they were getting no attention. Nor what was going on in New Orleans was really sucking the air out of the room. And Hurricane Rita, they just, they weren't getting the fundraising money coming in. So this wonderful man named Richard Schluschlag made a cold call to the office he was calling, asking for help for Cameron, Louisiana. Cameron, Louisiana was a little tiny town on the coast of Louisiana. When President Bush was in the offshore oil business, he would go to Cameron as a jumping off point to go visit his oil wells. So he was very familiar with Cameron and Richard knew that. And he called and he said, our town's been destroyed, including the hospital. We're in trouble here. And he said, in order for the people to feel comfortable to come back, we need health care is our number one priority. We need an emergency room. We would love to start if we can just rebuild the emergency room. And he said, even the offshore guys on the, on the oil rigs, it's our hospital and emergency room they come to help. Can President Bush help raise money for us just to build the emergency room and then we'll do the rest from there? So he of course said yes. And we got busy and we raised $2 million and we're gonna go to Cameron the week before Christmas with a check for $2 million and we're gonna break ground for the new emergency room. So I'm showing him the schedule that we put together. The governor was coming and the high school marching band was gonna march and he was taking them $2 million. It's a big deal when a former president goes to Cameron, Louisiana. With $2 million. And he looks at the schedule and I'll just, I'll just re do a reenactment here. He was sitting right at this desk. Again, this is the room where it happened. And he said, yeah, this is really boring, Gene. This is a boring schedule. And I think I had attitude. I said, really? I said, you're taking $2 million. And he said, Gene, these people have had a terrible year. We need to do something exciting. And then he said those words, I have an idea. I'm like, okay. He says, you know what, Barr and I have really gotten into this TV show 
called ER. We watch it every night, and there's this actor on it, George Clooney. He's our favorite. Let's invite him to go to Cameron with him, with us. And he says, do you get it, Gene? ER, emergency room. I said, I get it, I get it. Sir, so first of all, Max. Yes, ma'am. They were watching reruns on TNT. George Clooney wasn't on ER anymore. Quite frankly, I'm not sure ER was on anymore. <laughs> but he's the former president of the United States. He doesn't know what a rerun is. I said, sir, ER is not on TV anymore. It's on every night. Barr and I watch it every night. I said, George Clooney is now this huge movie star. People Magazine called him the sexiest man alive. I said, he's huge. And I said, we don't know him. I don't have his phone number. And I think his politics are a little to the left of yours. I'm thinking George Clooney is not going to Cameron, Louisiana with you the week before Christmas. Well, guess what? He went. He came and he went. We owe this to the great Jerry Weintraub who was one of President Bush's great friends, big time movie producer. He was the producer of all the ocean movies. President Bush could Google with the best of them. He Googled, because I told him about the ocean movies. He Googles George Clooney ocean. And he comes into my office. He says, well, you didn't tell me Jerry Weintraub knows George Clooney. He called Jerry Weintraub and who called George Clooney and George Clooney came. And they were, I mean, look at, look at those two. Look at those two Georges. I mean, is that not the cutest picture ever? Oh my gosh, I love that picture. I mainly wanted to tell that story so we could show that picture. So coming home, this is the untold story. Well, I should not have gone. I hope Dr. Fauci is not watching. I don't think he is, but I had a horrible cold that day. But I was not, not going to go on that plane to Cameron, Louisiana. We got a plane to bring George and Jerry Weintraub. They stopped here, picked us up, and we go to Cameron, have an amazing day. I think they shook every hand in town. The town went crazy. Diane Sawyer came and interviewed them. So coming home, President Bush fell asleep, Jerry Weintraub fell asleep, and George and I were sitting across from each other, and I asked him the question, why did you come? This part's in the book. I said, why did you come? You don't know George Bush. He said, you know what, Gene, I was so touched. He says, all the media, all the celebrities, everybody's in New Orleans. And here's this man trying to help this little bitty town named Cameron, Louisiana, that no one's heard of. There's no press there, but he's going. And I was touched by that, that he would want to do that. So this is the untold story. I'm not positive, but my ears completely plugged up. At that point, I had this horrible cold. George Clooney is talking, talking, talking to me. I could not hear one thing he's saying. And I'm just sort of nodding and, and agreeing because I'm sure he was saying brilliant things. Then I get up and go to the bathroom, a little too much information, but I come out and he's in the galley waiting for me. And we had to sort of squeeze past each other, which was a big moment for me. And then I realized that all this time that he was talking to me, I thought about this later. What if he asked me out? What if he was telling me that he wanted us to date? I will never know. And did I hurt his feelings by not saying I wanted to go out? This is because I'm out of my house and talking to a real person that I wanted to tell this story. I will never know. And then he got married. It's possible I broke his heart. I think it's likely. You think it's like I think it I is. Think, I think next time we do this, we need to bring him on and ask him. I, I, we still do exchange emails once in a while. I'm just so saying. There's a chance. I'm not sure his wife knows. All right. We'll keep that between us. Okay. So what we're talking about now and your George Clooney love affair, but more importantly, all that President Bush did with his friends like President Clinton and his new friend like George Clooney <laughs> to help Americans, to help people around the world in need. I mean, this is, he had a servant's heart. The Bush family is famous for putting others ahead of themselves, and they do it day in and day out. But one of the things that has been a privilege for me in this new role that I'm proud to be in are the people that I meet every day who tell stories about interactions they've had with President Bush. Maybe they ran into him at a coffee shop at Texas A&M. Maybe they ran into him at his favorite Mexican restaurant at the Galleria in Houston, and he did something that they remembered 
he um, you know, said something really nice, asked about themselves or their family, made them feel better when they weren't doing well. So all of us know about the famous things, the public things that President Bush has mm -hmm. done. But I get the sense from you and from this book that there was so much more that very few of us know about. So could you talk about those random acts of kindness? Um, so I'm gonna talk about one first that did become famous and um, it wasn't meant to become famous, but oh my gosh, it went viral. It was, it was the picture was up on the Times Square big board. There was a Secret Service agent uh, whose little boy, five-year-old, was diagnosed with leukemia. And you can only imagine how that touched the Bush's heart. And he was undergoing chemo and he lost all his hair. So his great dad, John, shaved his head to support his bald-headed son. And then President Bush's entire Secret Service detail shaved their head to support their colleague. And then President Bush one day, we're in Kennebunkport, shaved his head to support the little boy, Patrick, there they are. And the Secret Service, what's really interesting is I did not know he was doing this until he was done shaving his head. And Barbara Bush went to her grave blaming me that her husband shaved off all his hair at that age. She just was furious and she blamed me. But look at that precious picture. The great news is Patrick is now 12, I think, and has the biggest head of curly hair you've wow. ever seen. He, he survived his leukemia. But that one of the things I loved about President Bush is he was such a man of action. And he didn't sit around and think about, well, what should we do? He shaved his head. And the thing about that picture going viral, the leukemia folks, they raised a ton of money because I remember there was a lot of breaking news that day. I don't remember what was going on in the world. But the NBC Nightly News, it was Brian Williams, led the NBC Nightly News. There was like three huge breaking news stories. And he said, yet the photo of the day that everybody is talking about, and they showed that photo. And he just, he knew how to use his bully pulpit, but he also did the most random things. One of the funny things he used to do, this is such a silly thing to tell you, but we would come out of a lunch or a dinner or off a plane, and he says, do you need a ride? He was always wanting to give everybody <laughs> a ride. And I was, and people would say yes. Yes, I would love a ride home, but I would sort of give him the eye, like, really? This is before Uber, so I tried to be nice. But he just, he did, he just knew instinctively the right thing to do. So he was a man who cared about people, mm -hmm. about relationships. Um, he loved his family, he loved his friends. And he had many friends, many close friends and lifelong friends. But when I think of George H.W. Bush and friendships, I can't not think of James Baker and the amazing friendship that they had for so many years and what they both did together through difficult times and through good times and what that relationship meant to them and their families, but frankly also what it meant to America and the world to think about what they did together to make this country and the world a better place. I know you're close with Secretary Baker. Can you talk a little bit about that friendship, which is so famous, but so special? It is probably one of the most special friendships in American history. I really do believe that because you just said that friendship helped in the Cold War. That friendship helped see us through Desert Storm. They were an amazing team. And one of the amazing things, I, and I've heard Secretary Baker talk about this, is when he was traveling the world, as Secretary of State, they knew who, what his relationship with the President was, and they knew if he said this, this is what the President felt and wanted. Uh, so it was an amazing friendship. It began on the tennis courts here in Houston at the Houston Country Club, and they both constantly reminded me that they won the championship a number of times. And then Secretary Baker, who, as we all know, is just a brilliant man, went on to manage his campaigns and they were just incredible partners. But the part, I came into the friendship, of course, in the post White House years. And uh, watching them, they used to go to Christie's here in Houston for oysters a couple times a month. I once got invited to go with them, I was so excited. I never went again, because you weren't allowed to eat anything but oysters. <laughs> we had like three dozen oysters, it was, unbelievable but 
So when Secretary Baker's first wife died, he told me that he could not have gotten through that without George and Barbara Bush. And did they ever return that favor in spades? When Mrs. Bush died, they were there for him. They, they stood by his side. They came over every night and visited with them and had a martini with them. Secretary Baker used to sneak vodka into the hospital. Good I man. Hope he, I hope, good man. I hope he doesn't mind that I'm revealing that publicly. But he would take vodka to the hospital. Mrs. Bush eventually found out. But I actually I had the great privilege of having lunch with them yesterday. And uh, I've been telling the story about the night President Bush died. And Secretary Baker has caught a couple of the interviews. I do love this. He says, Gene, you're getting it just a little bit wrong. I'm like, OK. Uh, you tell me what's right. So we're going to clear the record right now. So the, the night, the day that President Bush died, uh, Secretary Baker came by that morning to see him, to check in. He was dressed. He was going to the office. President Bush was awake, and he said, Jimmy, where are you going? And Secretary Baker said to him, well, Hefe, he called him El Hefe, which means boss in Spanish. He said, Hefe, we're going to have it. I have been saying that Secretary Baker told them, you're going to have it, Hefe. And Secretary Baker told me yesterday, no, that's not right. I said, we're going to have it. Because I didn't want him to think he was going by himself. I'm like, okay. So anyway, he came, President Bush died at 10 o'clock at night. And uh, a lot of family was there, his doctors and, and the Bakers. And what Secretary Baker did, I mean, we prayed and he had called all his kids. Neil was there. He called the rest of his kids. And the last words he said to George W. was the last person he talked to. He said, I love you. Um, but Secretary Baker is just at the end of the bed rubbing his feet. He rubbed his feet the entire time. So there's the former president and this giant of a man, Jim Baker, rubbing his best friend's feet. It was so sweet. Um, one of the things I left out of the book, you know, John Meacham has accused me of hiding stories from him when he was writing Destiny and Power. You wouldn't do that, would you? Yeah, I did. I definitely had stories from him. We'll just tell the truth. I told him a lot, but yeah, I knew. Anyway, I can't believe, I, as it turns out, John should feel better. I had stories from myself. There's a couple things that I realized I left out of the book, and I think we're going to talk about one later. But I don't know how I didn't put this in. The night President Bush died, Ronan Tynan, the great singer Ronan Tynan, who President Bush was very good friends with, just happened to be in town. He was given a commencement address at a medical school here. And he came over and sang Silent Night to him the night he died. And President Bush sang with him. And it was just an amazing moment. And I, I'll put it in the, if I get to update the paperback, I'll add that to the book. You should. Can you talk a little bit about November 30th, 2018, and then what happened after that in those coming weeks? You know, that was an important moment for America and for the world. If you remember what was happening in politics and what was happening, um, you know, in America, there was um, a, a lot of infighting and partisanship there, there then? There was a lot of infighting, and we just came, we just gotten past the midterm elections in which there was a lot of political discourse. And I'm not going to talk politics. I promised myself I wouldn't. By the way, President Bush's last appearance in public was he went to vote. He early voted. And I, we had gotten him uh, some absentee, an absentee ballot. And he wanted to go vote. So Secretary Baker took him. They were at Christie's having oysters. And Secretary Baker decided, let's go vote El Jefe. And there's this wonderful picture of the two of them voting. I think, I actually think uh, Secretary Baker had already voted, but he went with them to help him with the ballot. I know they had some interested conversations on who to vote for. And Sully the dog is there in the background. But uh, it, was, it was a tumultuous time. And what was really wonderful the funeral week, the week of the funeral, the whole country just stopped and paid attention. The news was all about President Bush. And what was amazing to me, he died almost 26 years to the day that he lost the election in 1992. 
and 26 years later, he died, the most, one of the most revered people in our country and in the world. I mean, Prince Charles came to the funeral. Angela Merkel came to the funeral. She was quoted as saying, when she found out he died, she was quoted as saying, if it, she grew up in East Germany. And she said, if it weren't for this man, I would not be Chancellor of Germany. I, I owe him my career. And the whole world tuned in and, and stopped. For one week, they stopped fighting because to pay tribute to him. And all the presidents came to the funeral. And President Clinton sobbed. Um, and I, I'm <laughs> comforting him before the service. I thought this was sort of surreal. I'm patting him on the back saying, it'll be okay, President Clinton. I'm like, we've come a long way. By the way, President Obama saw him about three days before he died. He was in town to do an event for Secretary Baker. He asked to come by, and he came by, and I asked Neil to come over. John Meacham was in town to do the same event for Secretary Baker. He was going to interview the two of them at the Baker Institute. John Meacham came, Neil came, President Obama, I'm in the room. And we had a nice visit, and then President Obama asked for the room. He said, I would like to be alone with President Bush. So I cleared the room, and I hate to tell on John Meacham, but I looked around and realized, where did he go? He had snuck down to the end of the hall and was trying to eavesdrop on the two presidents. And I yelled at him and made him come away. But then I was very happy to know he knew what President Obama, he wanted to thank him for his service. Wow. And John said it was, okay, you're gonna make me cry. What a moment in history though, that's extraordinary. It was a great moment in history. So, you know, we're about 30 years since the president left the White House. And there's a lot of talk about the president's legacy. It's an mm -hmm. extraordinary legacy. You know, he lived a life in public service. He accomplished amazing things before he was ever president. And, you know, you mentioned it earlier, the end of the Cold War, you know, his foreign policy, what he did in Asia, what he did in the Middle East, what he did free trade with the early moves toward getting us to NAFTA. There's an extraordinary um, wealth mm. of accomplishments there. And we talk about legacies. Um, can you talk about what his living legacy is now? I think some people may be surprised by this answer. Uh, I will just say the points of light was very important to him, would still be important to him. He does want people to remember if you're gonna have a successful life, you've got to uh, serve others. He wants all of us to make a difference. But he also was a huge believer in public service and the George Bush School of Government and Public Service. Those, he did not want an institute, he did not want a foundation, he wanted a school. And it's one of the reasons why A&M, there's a lot of competition where his library would be located. The city of Houston really wanted it, as you can imagine. And A&M agreed to establish a, a, George, a George School of Government and Public Service. And he loved that school. He would go up and teach classes once in a while. Sometimes it was scheduled. Sometimes he would just pop in. He loved interacting with the students. I remember one time we were really busy. We were getting ready to leave for Maine. And I got a call from the school that they wanted to send a handful of, of students and teachers down to do a photo op with him for the next brochure of the school. And I said, you got 15 minutes. Here he is teaching a class at the school. That's Chuck Herman the first uh, uh, dean of the school. And uh, he loved teaching them. He just loved the students. He sees them as the future of our country. He says they are our future. They can get us through anything. They're smart and they love this country. But I, to go back, I told, I told the students and the teachers, yeah, you have 15 minutes, he's busy. Well, every time I tried to pull him out of this office, you're gonna to have to do the dance any minute now. Yes, um, he, he looked at me, I got the eye. Not now, Gene. I think they were in here for two hours. Wow, well, I know how much um, Texas a and meant to him and how revered he is to this day in Aggie Land. It's mm -hmm. an extraordinary place. And when you see how Texas A&M puts other people before themselves, mm -hmm. service first, it's very clear 
why the president chose Texas A&M for his presidential library. It's, it's why they're buried there. And, you know, there was some discussion in the very beginning about where they'd be buried, and it didn't take President Bush very long. He wanted to be buried at Texas A&M. And the Union Pacific was so amazing, they arranged for a train to take President Bush from Houston to College Station. And if you have time, you can talk about that amazing engine, 4141. But along the way, this is one of my favorite photos from that amazing week. There was a group of cowboys waiting along the tracks, waiting to salute him. And the, the, one of the men in the photo told me the story. There was a whole bunch more horses lined up, but the train tooted its horn to, to greet them, and half the horses ran away. But what a great photo this is. I love photo. this photo. Well, because you gave me the opening, just real quick, I, I will remind our friends who are watching that Union Pacific 4141 is now in front of the Library and Museum in College Station. And as you know, Gene, since you're on our board and I work for you, <laughs> that we're building toward the President's centennial birthday in 2024. And at that time, we're going to open a new building at the library. It's going to have 4141 in it. It's going to have a new Marine One helicopter that we'll be getting soon. It's going to have new event space. It's going to have a restaurant. And so we're very excited about that. There's a lot of great things that are happening at the foundation. We're really excited that the library is about to reopen this summer. We haven't had guests in there for, for almost a year and a half, so that'll be extraordinary. Um, this fall, we're going to have a great um, Gulf War anniversary event to talk about what President Bush, Secretary Baker, and the rest of the bush Quail administration did to liberate Kuwait and the lessons that we can take forward from that. And also, because of our coffee that we have here. Coffee. Yeah, this is definitely coffee that we're drinking at 6.15 yes, at night. I yes. have to mention for all of our friends that um, we are going to have our annual Vintner dinner here in Houston on <laughs> November 18th. So I have to put a plug in for that. I'm going to give you the last word. But before I do, a big thank you um, mm -hmm. to all of our friends and supporters, everybody who tuned in tonight, um, particularly our board um, and our, our supporters who make our work happen. Um, I'd also, again, like to thank our friends at Charter Communications for their support um, and their very important partnership. And Jean, I think you have some lessons to share with us. I, first of all, I need a favor. Yes, ma'am. Do you need your glasses? I need my glasses, okay. which I threw on the floor. You did that very smoothly. Well, they kind of blend that, in. With they the sort of blend rug. in. So I've not had a chance to read from the book all week. So. Again, the best thing about this book is all our life lessons that he left us. These are 10 pieces of advice that he wrote to a group of young people. They're short, so I'm just going to read them quickly. Um, number one, don't get down when your life takes a bad turn. Out of adversity often comes challenge and success. Number two, don't blame others for your setbacks. Number three, when things go well, always give credit to others. Number four, don't talk all the time. Listen to your friends and mentors and learn from them. Number five, don't brag about yourself. Let others point out your virtues and your strong points. Number six, give someone else a hand. When a friend is hurting, show that friend you care. Number seven, nobody likes an overbearing big shot. Number eight, as you succeed, be kind to people. Thank those who helped you along the way. Number nine, don't be afraid to shed a tear when your heart is broken because a friend is hurting. The whole Bush family cries. They're big criers. Number 10, say your prayers. That's, that's a great list of lessons to live by, right? It's a great list of lessons to live by. I miss him. Okay, say something funny, quick. Well, Jean, I, I was, I'm proud of us because before this we were talking about our concern, since we always crack each other up, that this would turn into weekend update. We were afraid of Saturday Night Live skits. It's not too late for you to do the dance to Hamilton. But here's the good news. Yes, ma'am. We are going to end on a funny note. Is it time for me to introduce the video? It's time. Is it time? So a lot of you have seen this video, but you cannot see this video too often. It is, it's called The Bushes Unplugged. It actually is at the library. It runs on a constant loop. Most of these videos were done over the years. A lot of it was done to raise money for literacy. We did a lot of these. Mrs. Bush hosted 
every year celebration of reading to raise money for the George and Barbara, I mean, for the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy. And they love to do a funny opening. But we use these videos over the years and it's just the Bushes and their fabulous self-deprecating humor. So I'm gonna warn you, the video is about 14 minutes long. So if you need to eat dinner, if you need to walk the dog, if you need to put your kids to bed, you might wanna say goodbye. But if you have 14 minutes, you might wanna pour yourself a cup of coffee and just enjoy this video. It's just a joyful way to end this conversation. And I think we're gonna say goodbye now. Um, so when the video's over, don't, don't be disappointed. Max and I will not be back. Thank, Thank you, you Jane. Thanks for an amazing evening. Thanks for all of you for joining us. Thank you. This has been a lot of fun. Absolutely. <laughs>
Is Arnold Schwarzenegger there? Yes. It's George Bush. That's right, the president. No, no, though I'm not the president, I'm a president. I'm number 41. He's in a meeting? Well, never mind. Or the time I went to have lunch with George W. shortly after he won the election. Stop. Ma'am, would you please step this way? What are you doing? This is Barbara Bush. You know, the mother of the president. Oh, no. I am so sorry. Please accept my humble apologies. Don't worry about it. You're not doing this to all the people coming into this restaurant. Are you? No, ma'am, I'm only checking two kinds of people. The ones who look like reporters and the ones who look dangerous. Or out on the golf course. Suddenly, no one gives me the same gimme putts that they used to concede to me. That looks like a gimme to me. Come on. Sir, uh, we'd like you to putt that, please. When I was president, you guys used to give me these putts. Put it. I stood up to Saddam Hussein. You think I'm afraid of a tiny little putt like this? <sighs> Even my former colleagues on the world stage seem different. I think we can do something in the United Nations Security Council to resolve this crisis in the Middle East. That's my opinion, you see. Ну что тут говорить? Я думаю, что это тот только время терять. Надо это решать у президента. What do you say? Uh, Mr. President, he kind of says he understands your point. Mm -hmm. Well, he kind of says you're the man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Go. Even just sitting at home on the weekend is different now. You're not going to make me watch reruns of Survivor again on a Saturday night. Look, okay, but tonight I think they're finally going to kick Jerry off. Did you talk to Laura? No, she's on a return from her West Coast tour. Did you talk to George? No, he, he was busy. I think it's a state dinner for Queen Elizabeth tonight. Hello? Mrs. Bush, hi, it's Dana Carvey. Hi, Dana, how are you? I, I'm great, listen, I'm calling because I'm, I'm trying to reach the president. You mean 41? Just a minute, please. No, I'm actually trying to reach the real president, the one in Washington. Dana, just the man I wanted to talk to. I've been thinking about your impersonation. And you know, I, I think we need to update it. You know, spice it up a little. Well, Gosh, Mr. President, I, I don't know. I mean, don't you like, you know, not gonna do it or wouldn't be printing at this juncture? I mean, those are, those are good, right? So anyway, I was wondering. But look, don't get me wrong. Not gonna do it still works. Wouldn't be prudent still works. And I even like it's bad. It's bad. <laughs> yeah, well, um, actually, Mr. President, I was calling to ask if I could do an impersonation of your son. No, of course not. I, I, I don't mind. That's no problem. But listen, uh, I've jumbled more than my fair share of sentences, too. Uh, maybe we could work that into the next routine. <laughs> well, I've got a subliminal feeling, but Hispanically, that might work. God bless you, and God bless America. And uh, um, I'm going to think about that, but um, I've got to run. So uh, I'll talk to you later. Okay, bye. I think he likes it. Oh, good.
Hello, friends. Jim Nance with CBS Sports from the Masters Tournament in Augusta, Georgia. And before we get to this competition featuring the best players in the world, CBS is proud to reveal some never-before-seen footage of a rare competition that's been taking place up in Kennebunkport, Maine. Just take a look at these two who have been battling it out right down to the finish line. So Barbara Bush is the winner there, and we'll continue with our Masters coverage in just a moment.